Joe. Joe on Joe is the only podcast where Joe talks about Joe. And now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to Joe on Joe. It is me, your host, Joe Slepsky. And uh, we're back this week. Now, I was I took a sick day off last week, and I'm still feeling a little under the weather. I don't say that for sympathy, but I do say that for time. Uh, I don't have a lot of breath this week. I got a little bit of a sinus thing going on, and it's now in my chest. So uh, this may be a little shorter than normal, but that's okay. Because this week we are not doing a traditional illustrated. We're not doing uh, any of the episodes. What we're doing this week is I wanted to take some time out to celebrate an artist, a creator, who meant a lot to me when it comes to G.I. Joe, specifically, uh, uh, Mark Bright. He passed away earlier this week. Uh, a lot of you know him from his work. He did the uh, the Snake Eyes trilogy, and he was the first man to illustrate Snake Eyes' busted-up face. You guys remember that close-up? Uh, I still say it wasn't busted-up enough, though. <laughs> I really wanted, like, uh, you know... Uh, like Toxic Avenger level, uh, <laughs> but still, Mark's a, Mark was absolutely amazing, and he meant a whole lot to me, and not just with G.I. Joe, so I wanted to take some time today and uh, talk about him, and talk about his work, there's, you know, he's one of those creators that contributed a, a fair chunk to the G.I. Joe mythos, and, and we're in the middle of talking about it, so let's spend some time talking about him. Um, if you guys love Mark Wright, uh, please reach out to me on social media, say hello on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Joe and Joe pod. Send me an email, Joe and Joe pod at gmail.com. Let me know how much you love Mark Wright, man. And as always, please give some support and love to our wonderful sponsors, the movies in a meal podcast. They, uh, they're here every week, keeping this, keeping the lights on for you, for me, for everybody. Uh, they love GI Joe. They love, uh, I saw some hot, hot Godzilla Kong talk this week. So please uh, help support them, help support this show, and give them a listen. Uh, Movies in a Meal podcast, just an absolute uh, great people to have a, have have in your corner. So we're here to celebrate Mark Bright, of course. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of his wiki. We're going to talk about, like, I never met him personally, so I never had the pleasure. Uh, and I don't know much about him. So well, I'm learning a lot of this today as I, as I did some research on him. Um, but what I do love is that when I look at his bio... It is stocked with books that I've absolutely read. I, like I think I've read like eighty percent of his work, and that makes me so happy. Um, I never really, you know, t- kept tally of that over the years. But when I when I go to the the fandom pages and I look at all the books he's worked on, I go, oh, have that, have that, have that. Read it, read it, read it. So we're gonna do some of that. We're gonna look over uh, some of the stuff and, and think about the memories there, and. Just really celebrate someone who who absolutely did a gave a lot to GI Joe. So if you're if you if you're not familiar with his work, uh, listen up because we're going to talk about some specifics with GI Joe. There'll be some spoilers, I guess. Um, you know, not everyone I know not everyone has a complete run of the series and stuff. His work did come in the um, uh, numerically in the like the late '90s, early 100s of the series. So if you don't have those issues, that might be a gap in your collection. Um, and I know they're hard to get digitally. But hopefully those, I believe Skybound's going to be doing a compendium. So, well, actually, I, I know that because listener and friend of the show, Scotty, you uh, reached out to Skybound and asked them about that. I saw that in the letters page. I'm seeing a lot of people on the letters page that that uh, we know through the show. And I freaking love it, man. I love it. Everyone's keep writing. I think I got it. I need to write a letter to Skybound to celebrate what they're doing there. But we're going to celebrate Mark Bright today. So. I uh, hope you come along with me on this ride. I hope you guys have enjoyed his work as well. And, uh, you know, here we go. So Mark Bright, born in 1955. They called him Doc Bright because his initials were uh, Mark D. Bright. So it was like MD, like he's a doctor. I never knew that. I knew they called him Doc Bright, and I would see it in the in the pages. Um, but I never knew that, like, the I thought the D stood for Doc, but apparently it doesn't. It was just his middle initial was D, so people said he like was MD. So he that's why they called him Doc Bright. If you look at a lot of his early stuff, even really, um, <clears throat> there was a you would see it credited just to Doc Bright, not even Mark Bright. So it's great. I love it. Uh, one of those quirks of comics. Comics are so funny. You when you see a movie, everyone's credits and everyone's. Um, you know, names and stuff has to be perfect. And everyone, you know, you look at a comic book and 
the, the credits are all over the place. Not only uh, half the time people are using, there's people using uh, fake names because they, not because they were ashamed of the work in Hollywood. You'll see someone use a fake name. Uh, what is that? The, um, Oh, I forget what the fake producer name is that they use, but there's a specific one that they use. Uh, they'll use it because they're ashamed of the work. That certainly has happened in comics, but a lot of times back in the day, they were using pseudonyms because like the inking, for example, took like 18 different people and they, it was great work, but you couldn't credit 18 people. So they would call themselves, you know, the crusty bunkers or whatever. Um, so that's really funny. I love that about comic books, but Mark Bright, Doc Bright, uh, he got a start in house of mystery from uh, DC, a uh, three page story in house of mystery in 1978. And then it'd be another five years uh, until he teamed up with Christopher Priest, who is an absolute underappreciated talent. I'm a massive Chris Priest fan. Uh, back in the day, he was, uh, he was, if I recall, he was the first African American uh, editor at Marvel Comics. Um, he edited the Spider Man books and he ended up writing a bunch of the Spider Man books. At the time, editors wrote a lot of stuff. That's the way it was. And, um, personal reasons. He changed his name to Christopher priest. And, and for a long time, he just went by priest. Um, he's the reason you, the, uh, the black Panther movie that we saw that we all love black Panther, that whole Wakanda for everything, all that stuff. Um, a lot of that is pulled from a uh, friend, Reggie Hudlin and his work, but Reggie Hudlin's work was absolutely built on the shoulders of Chris Priest's work, which Mark Bright had a little bit of contribution to. He did a few of those issues, but Chris Priest's work on Black Panther with the Marvel Knight stuff really established Wakanda as, you know, this future, future techno state, um, giving, giving Black Panther all these gadgets instead of just running around on a black leotard, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so Chris Priest, his influence can't be, you can't talk about Mark Bright without talking about Chris Priest is what I'm saying. They teamed up on a lot of books. Most famously, Quantum and Woody, um, which is their co you know creator own book. They put it out through uh, Valiant. Uh, it had a uh, recent um, revival in 2015, both as actually as a revamp by uh, different uh, different creators, but also Chris Priest and, and and Mark Bright came back to do their own miniseries on it, which was great. But their original run on Quantum and Woody, late 90s, was absolutely brilliant. Very 100 percent character driven. So good. Um, it's funny, very funny. And comic books are hard to be funny. I think that's, that's a, that's a truism. It is hard to write a genuinely funny comic book. There are few and far between there's punny books and there's gag books and there's, you know, satirical books like, you know, mad magazine style comedy. And that's certainly a thing, but to write a, to write a comic book in continuity, in character that fits in those universes and is still funny. That's a very hard thing to do. They both accomplished that with Quantum and Woody. I mean, it's its own universe, but it it could fit in. A, it was a standard superhero universe. They really nailed it. Quantum and Woody is absolutely great. Um, of course, he was the artist on Am Armor Wars, uh, uh, Iron Man's Armor Wars. If you're not familiar with Armor Wars, uh, Marvel has talked they're going. I think that was going to be Rhodes. Uh, next movie or then it was a TV. So I don't know what they're doing with armor wars. Armor wars is an absolutely fabulous comic book story. It, it may work as a movie. It may work as a TV show. I don't know. Don't let that be your first exposure to armor wars. Get the iron man armor wars trade, read it online, go to Marvel, you know, Marvel unlimited, read it. It's about eight issues, nine issues, something like that. It was done in the days before, uh, like they're really corporatized your story arc has to be 12 issues and it has to be this so we can prepackage it. And, you know, like it was just a long story that, that they told in, um, uh, Bob Layton wrote it, I believe, or no, Michelini, Michelini wrote it. And, um, it was just a long story and it was like nine issues. It was a weird number of issues and it was absolutely fabulous. And Mark drew all of it except the epilogue, which of course they brought in Barry Windsor Smith to do the epilogue, which of course that's amazing. Um, and he did the Green Lantern Emerald Dawn miniseries, which has fallen out of both. I think it's fallen out of both continuity and favor, but for a very long time, it was the driving origin for Green Lantern. Um, there was, you know, people, eventually people didn't like it. They, they, they said, you know, like it, um, you know, it made Hal, uh, gave him an alcohol, a drinking problem. 
you know, in his early days, that was the, that was the hurdle he had to get over, you know, um, it was the era where they were trying to find the damage in all the DC heroes, right? They were grim and it was the start. It was post dark Knight. They were starting to grim and gritty it up. Uh, and Emerald Dawn came along to kind of revamp the Iron Man origin. Um, I love it. I think it's fabulous. Uh, even though it's continuity wise, I think, uh, been, been kicked off to the curb. Uh, that's another, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So he did some GI Joe stuff in 1990 and he did, it was, it was that, that really intensive snake eyes era, right? Where he got his face fixed. It was the, that, that three parter with those Lee weeks covers, you know, um, he had a storm and rescue storm, the, uh, Cobra castle and rescue, um, Scarlet got his, you know, he got, he got that BDSM uniform as we discussed when we covered those books. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, uh, his, uh, action figure wise, it was his V3 look, um, with the trench knives across his chest. And, uh, and that's all Mark Bright drawn that the interiors. Um, I don't know if I actually can't think that he did the covers. I think those were all Lee Weeks covers. Um, but the interiors were all Mark Bright all through that era. It was like 97 through like 106 or something. It was right up to, um, right up to a couple issues before they ended up killing everybody. And those G.I. Joe books were awesome. They were absolutely great. The interiors were absolutely great. And, uh, he also worked on the the trading cards, which we're gonna get into. I'm just I'm jumping ahead because I I could just I'm I'm uh what am I doing? I'm I'm laying seeds for you guys to follow because we're gonna get there. Um, so his first work back to his first work with Christopher Priest, um, was the Falcon miniseries. And uh, Mark was African American uh, as well as Chris, and so to have the two of them do the first miniseries for the Falcon had to be huge for them. Um, it's funny that miniseries, the first issue is drawn by Paul Smith. It was meant for either Marvel fanfare or like Marvel premiere. One of those like one-off Marvel stories. And they liked it so much. They asked priest Owsley at the time to turn it into a miniseries. And so uh, that he brought in doc bright to do it. And it's great. It looks great. But that's if you ever read that series, it's totally disjointed, like ridiculously disjointed. Um, the first issue is pretty much its own adventure. And then the other three issues that follow are just it's also its own adventure. So it doesn't read very well as a as a, you know, like a solid miniseries. I think that's why it's not really regarded highly as, you know, a great four issue adventure because it's just disjointed. But it's so competently done. And like imagine those three powerhouses paul smith's powerhouse paul smith's especially at that time his stuff is great him owsley and mark bright working on that book of course the only reason it's not considered legendary is because like some editorial hijinks of you got to turn one story into four uh so yeah so that's it so he did that uh and then chronologically he then i think believe he then went to power man and iron fist the final 10 issues of that, which I, I want to say were being written by uh, Kurt Busick, Thunderbolts fame. I know he worked on, he wrote a lot of Power Man and Iron Fist at the time. I think he did the final issues. Um, he then did some solo Avenger stuff. Uh, Iron Man came around in 87. He did the actual issues of it. And then he moved over to DC. He also was doing Action Comics Weekly at the time. That was over at DC. Uh, that would have been around 87, 88. Um, post Burns action run because it was when Byrne was treating action as a team up book. Uh, and it, it culminated in like, what was it, action 600 and then 601 was the start of the action comics weekly. Um, I, to be honest, I don't recall what many, what, like what story he did in action weekly. If you're unfamiliar with that series, they took action, which was always a Superman book and they only, they turned it to giving Superman just two pages. And I want to say Kurt Swan drew the middle two pages for most of them. Um, and so Superman had a two page spread and right in the middle of the book. And then the other four stories in it were, it was an oversized, they were oversized issues were, uh, B level DC characters, Nightwing, uh, secret six and mockingbird. Um, green lantern had a long run. Cause at the time green lantern didn't even have his own series. That's, that's where green lantern was floundering at the time. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to place what, Mark would have drawn and he did do a run, but I, I don't think he did green lantern. I think that was being done by Joe Statton still. 
Um, but he might have might have been Green Lantern, but I do think that was still Joe Staten, who had been doing the Green Lantern core stuff uh, before they before that book folded. Anyway, that book was great. Um, it was great because doing a weekly book in 1987, 86, 87, 88 had to be really difficult because you didn't have computers. You didn't have technology. You couldn't email files to people. You had to send everything FedEx and to get that done on a weekly schedule. Absolute, absolute achievement. Um, some of the stories are, you know, good, bad, or ugly, but the, the achievement of actually getting it out and getting it produced stellar, absolutely huge. Um, so we worked on that. Then he did the green lantern stuff. He did, uh, Emerald Wars, or Emerald Dawn, sorry, Emerald Wars and Emerald, Emerald Wars. There's that's your that's your uh, amalgam mashup. He did uh, Emerald Dawn, and then he came back and did a nice long run around uh, issue. Did he do Mosaic? Did he draw the Mosaic? He might have drew, drew the Mosaic issues. He didn't do the Mosaic series, but it was right around the late teens. Um, actually, I called it up here. Green Lantern. Yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did. He did the mosaic stuff. So he started on like issue 13 of Green Lantern and he drew the mosaic um, six issue miniseries, which basically worked as its own miniseries within the pages of the Green Lantern book. And mosaic was the first time that they took a chance and gave Jon Stewart his own book, um, both later as the book called mosaic, but within Green Lantern just really gave him the book. Um, he had it during crisis, but Hal was always running around. Uh, Mosaic was like just a straight up tryout for a, for a, a John Stewart series. It was they 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 sent him to a planet that was a patchwork planet, very much like the, the Secret Wars Battle World over at Marvel, uh, and he had to figure out how to get these uh, civilizations to work together. Um, this would have been around the time of Cosmic Odyssey. He was a, a, a big star in Cosmic Odyssey with Mike Mignola, Jim Starlin. Um, so they were really pushing John Stewart at the time. So, so Mark Bright came in, really loved Mosaic. It was great. Then that launched his actual own, own series, which I want to say was drawn by Cully Hammer, I think, memory serves. But they killed Chip. They had him run over by a truck. Um, but then he stayed on Green Lantern. He, so he did those six issues of for John Stewart, and he came back for Green Lantern 25. He did about another you know, 10, 15, 20. Wow, he drew it all the way up to 46. Oh, yeah, so he did the, um, wasn't 46 the uh, destruction of Coast City? Yeah, so he he drew Green Lantern all the way through the destruction of Coast City with the death of Superman. Um, so he's got a long run on Green Lantern. And then 1990 comes around, and uh, here comes G.I. Joe. And we're talking about, uh, let me call it up here. Yeah, like 1989, 1990, he starts drawing G.I. Joe and a lot of Snake Eyes stuff. This was the era where we introduced the new October Guard. Cobra Commander came back. Do you remember that? It's that big issue with him standing on the cover with his hands up in the air. I'm back. I believe that cover is... I don't know. That's a Ron Wagner cover. culminates of course in the you know in 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 snake eyes oh oh yeah that's right he he does the uh he did the the return where where zartan and billy and and our boy tyrone justice for tyrone uh mark bright drew that issue in uh gi joe number 97 uh so he yeah yeah and there it is there it is here's the snake eyes uh the snake eyes trilogy that's right that's what i keep I think I keep misnaming it. Yeah, the Snake Eyes trilogy. So that's G.I. Joe 93 through 94. Snake Eyes unmasked. You know, he gets the new face and it gets damaged again. Um, that trilogy is epic. It's absolutely great. And that's Mark Breitra on it. It's just uh, just a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. Um, he also contributed, from what I found, about a third of the cards. You guys remember the G.I. Joe Impel trading cards, 1992? 293 I think um for those of you who haven't been able to get a collection of those together they're great and they're very uh, affordable very affordable if you're hearing this and you've not gotten yourself a set of the GI Joe Impel trading cards you really should because they're great they're drawn really well it's not just Mark Bright um there's a lot of great artists on it they're very clean 
they look great in a binder. They're nice to flip through. Uh, and I was going through it trying to look for, you know, the, the, the ones that I could see were drawn by, by Mark. Um, there's a few that I think were drawn by Mark, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. But then you get to the section, uh, right around issue number 61. And it's the, um, official battle gear section, right? So there's different sections of the trading cards. There's, uh, the original team section, you know, where they have all the, you know, the, the OG Joes, there's the, um, uh, rank and file where it's some of the more, you know, just, just regular common GI Joes with, you know, uh, there's the, the, uh, what do they call it? Patrols, which are like Python patrol, things like that. And then you get the, the battle gear section and, his stuff pops. And I look at that and I go, oh, yeah, that's absolutely Mark Bright. He did wetsuit. His wetsuit picture is great. Gung-ho in his, in his dress gear. Uh, we've got Payload in space. Deep Six in his V2 look. Um, Lightfoot. Fast Draw. Salvo. Hardball. Outback. Airtight. Charbroil. I believe he did, yeah. Looks like he did ambush too. So he might have actually just done this entire section. Pathfinder, hit and run. Did he do the Desert Scorpion? I would wager he did. I can't. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, he totally did. Because there's a uh, if you're if you're looking at comic artists that you really love, there's always something about their work that either you like or just stands out that you recognize. Um, Example, uh, Jim Starlin draws an extended midsection. Uh, Walter Simonson, when he draws a fist, there's always one or two knuckles that are protruding and pointing forward. That's one of his trademarks. Um, Mark Bright has a trademark squint in the eyes where, like, the characters, when they furrow their brow. That's a trademark. He also draws people, Drew, rather, uh, in a crouch like ready for action. He did that so well. Uh, I think that's what, one of the things I liked about his stuff is that his characters were never standing around. They were, they were ready to go. And when you look at all these, you know, these are just training card images. Everyone is crouched in some way. No one's standing there. If you think about, think about how, think about what the nineties did for action on a page and how they destroyed it. Right. 90s action was either standing straight still staring at the camera or they've already extended and expended their energy and they're flying at the, you know, flying at someone and they're, you know, like that was it. There was no, uh, there's no tension. There's no moment before the coil, before the spring. You look at Mark Bright's using these, using laying these, laying these GI Joe cards out in front of me, and you see the you see the rhythms here. You see that he's he's got this. Um, everyone's got a little crouch. Everyone's got a little bend in their knee, right? What does that do? That just makes it makes them on the move, coiled for action. They're about to jump off, and what's more exciting than that? Like I'd much rather see someone like about to do the jump off. Because they're, it's just so much more exciting for you know for a flat page. I get it if you're if you're if you're animating if you're drawing you know something that's live or you're or filming something live action. Yeah, you show the moves and stuff. But comics are different, man. Comics we've saw it, said this a lot on the show. Comics are, are just a different language. And I'll take that coiled tension. Think about Wolverine in the sewers by John Byrne. You know, there's a lot to love about that picture. But one of the biggest things about that picture, and he's looking up at the camera, you know, he just got dropped through by the Hellfire Club. You guys know the picture. That's just, that's just tension. That's just his muscles are ready to spring. Like someone's going to die on the next page, right? That's what you get. Not necessarily death is G.I. Joe, but that's what you get in all these, uh, these great bright illustrations. Um, Techno Viper, Toxo Viper, Hydro Viper. I believe these are all bright. Uh, Range Viper. I think he did the Astro Viper. He definitely did Targat. So, yeah, it seems like they just gave him this section and the Night Viper. So I'd be surprised if he didn't do all of these because they really look like all of them. Uh, and then on the back, you look and you've got the close up of their faces. And the other thing that I absolutely loved is his mouths. He did a um, 
I don't know. Um, I think it's a, I think it, the best description would be like a taciturn, like with your mouth shut, kind of like, mm, going like, mm, I'm a little frustrated. He did that really well. His characters, that's one of his hallmarks. Uh, nailed it. He also did a square jaw on a comic book character, like not necessarily the chin. I'm not talking about, I mean, his chins were good. Don't get me wrong. But his jawline, like the back, whatever the back of the mandible is, like no one gave a bigger mandible, just a square, square headed, jawed face like like that could take a punch. His were absolutely dynamite. Uh, that is one of his trademarks. Um, it's how I identified his work when, when I was especially when I was a young kid and, you know, there was no Internet. There was no this. There was no that. You just. I would just look at that and go, oh, that was drawn by that guy who did Armor Wars. And that was drawn by that guy who did Green Lantern. I really like his stuff. Let me go check more of his stuff out. Um, looking else through here, there's a few other ones that I think might have been him. It looks like Major Altitude might have been his stuff. And we're in the uh, uh, the recruits here. And this is, I'm sorry, I say 93. This is 1990, 91. I apologize for saying that. Um So yeah, there's some more here that that seem like they're Mark Bright work, but I can't be sure. I think he did Dusty. I think he did Red Star. I think he did Big Ben. I'm not sure if he did Cobra Commander though. To be fair, oh yeah, well definitely did Dusty again because you go on the back and you look at his face and the, the, he gave like the the that that flat jaw mount that flat jaw. Um, I bet you he did Tunnel Rat. Yeah, there's so many in here that he did. I, to be honest, there there probably is a website that literally names all of these. I did some. I couldn't find one. Um, although I, dummy, didn't check the main 3D Joes one. I I just used Google, but I they probably have this on 3D Joes or or, or uh, uh, yojo.com. So, <laughs> but again, uh, hey, I've been sick. My head's not straight. So he just defined the look of so many Joes of that era, that, that late nineties or late eighties, early nineties era. He just absolutely nailed it. Um, and that's, that was for me. That was also when I was getting subscriptions too. So that was coming in my house. You know, I didn't even go to the store for those. That was, that was me saying, I want to get this. I don't want to miss an issue. So that really, it just meant so much. Um, I'm pretty sure I first saw him on green lantern. And it was in a DC sampler. I think it was from 1988. Uh, so I would have been 13. And they it was like a free DC sampler. And it had a, a sample pages from Emerald Dawn. And it was the first few pages. Written by written by uh, Chris Priest, Jim Owsley. He only wrote the first issue, though. Uh, and I was, I was actually had the opportunity to ask him that. And he said he wrote one issue and didn't feel it. So he gave it back to the editor and said, someone else take it over. Cause I'm not going to do a good job with it. Um, which is really stand up like to say that, no, this is a big project because they're redefining the origin of one of the major characters. And, uh, he just didn't have it in him. He just wasn't feeling it. That's what he told me. Um, and the explosion of the airplane in the beginning, and the, the caption was the stentorian bark of an angry God. And you could pretty sure you can quote me on that. Uh, and just this explosion that, that Mark drew just, popped off the page man like it, it's like the sunbow explosion you guys know the sunbow does great explosions mark bright did great explosions there was a, a you know it's a kinetic energy it's just like his his figure his figure um acting right his characters had kinetic energies his characters had things they were about to do and you saw it on the page they weren't standing around they were getting crouched and getting ready to go into action even if it was just to like get a cup of coffee they were like, I'm getting that coffee with gusto. Uh, that's what his explosions did, man. His explosions were like, yeah, we just blew something up, but boy, is there more energy in there to be expelled. That's what Sunbow did on the cartoon. If you think about the Joe cartoon, Sunbow, those explosions were dynamite, both uh, the color of them, but just the, the, the roiling expansiveness of them. And it was, there's a containment to it, but then, Points where it just 
becomes an outlet for this energy that, you know, that, that's how I, that's how I always think of the sunbow explosions. Same thing with Mark Bright. There's a few other creators that, that, that achieve that. Um, someone like, for example, uh, one, my favorite artist of all time, Walter Simonson, he doesn't do his explosions like that. He does different explosions. He does explosions where it is everything. Like his explosions are, that's it. That's all you're going to get. Like there's, it's the biggest thing. God came down and blew something up. That's what Simonson's explosions are. Mark Bright's explosions are like, it still wants to give you more. After he snapped that photo of that explosion, he wants you to think that there's still more to be, to be drained. Um, that, that's, I think that's the best way I could, I could, uh, I could describe it. Just absolutely fabulous. Um, so we're going to check, checking out his DC stuff. He did a, a very fun mini series called a bizarro. That's uh, I, for some reason, Steve Gerber jumps into my head as the, as the writer on that. If I'm wrong, I'm not even gonna look it up. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but it was very fun, very underrated. And it literally is about a bizarro. It's kind of like I robot. That's the play on. It was about someone who got turned into a, it wasn't traditional bizarro bizarro. It was someone got turned into a bizarro. So it was a bizarro. Um, really great. Of course he did all the, all the icon stuff, which was a part of the milestone verse, which was over at DC, but you know, he worked on icon one, two, three, one through Jesus. He did 42 issues of icon. I, that might be the whole run. I, I don't recall when that book ended. Um, really, really great. He had a, he had a small run on Batman too. Uh, and it's funny we talk about Snake Eyes' trench knife. There's a, a great Batman cover with ba- close up of Batman's face, and there's a giant trench knife right in front of Batman. And I'm all, I've always been like, that's very reminiscent of Snake Eyes' chest trench knives. Uh, uh, he did a little bit in night in like the night nightfall night end. I guess it looks like I must have done one issue. Um, a little bit. He did a little bit on Batman. He did uh, did a little bit of Dead Man. We talked about his great run on Green Lantern, and that I mean that was that was some solid Green Lantern stuff. Of course, it led to Hal getting, um, ki- you know, well, going crazy and then getting killed. So, as a uh, character success, that run doesn't really hold up because it just led to you know Green Lantern not really hitting with people and, and having to be replaced. I always have a soft spot for it because that's that was a run I was reading when I was in high school. It was my first run with Green Lantern. Um, I really loved it. I loved Guy Gardner. It uh, it featured Guy a lot in it. In during that time, I used to bring it to school and read it with my buddy Derek Honaki. Derek, if you're out there, shout out. We used to read Green Lantern together. I'm I'm out on you. But he did Emerald Dawn one. Of course, he did Emerald Dawn two. Two was great. It wasn't. Um, it, it just did. Telling a character's origin always has more pop than telling the next day. And, and Emerald Dawn two was simply the next day. Um, it was more the origin of Sinestro than it was the origin of, of Hal. Um, and that's good, but not as interesting to me. Um, but it was, but it was really great. So Emerald, I love the Emerald Dawn stuff. I urge you guys pick up a copy of it. It's really, really solid. He also did four issues on uh, a great series of Valor, which was the spinoff of technically, I guess, a Legion of Superheroes spinoff where it featured Monel before he went into the future post invasion. Uh, where the Daxamites came to Earth, uh, and it was Monel's adventure in our current time, as he s- eventually leads up to him seeding the planets that would eventually become the home planets for the Legionnaires. As a series, it was uh, it suffered a lot from editorial uh, uh, caveats. Like it came at a time where there were a lot of crossovers. Um, it spun out of the. Um, Eclipso crossover, it then ran into zero hour, like, you know, and that's no one's fault. That's just the, that was the time and they were doing it. The fact that they gave, I think it went 18 issues. The fact that they gave Valor slash Monel his own series is amazing. Um, but Mark started it. So he did the first four issues of it and it was great. I loved his take on it. Uh, he did some work in Secret Origins. He did a couple things in the Titans. Um, yeah, and that's it. So I mean, his his big stamp at DC was was really it was Green Lantern and Icon. Those are the real big things. Uh, and I, I I've read again. I've read most all of these. Absolutely, most all of these books. It's really awesome. Um, so GI Joe. So over at Marvel, 
Power Man, we did talked about that. He did a, a, an issue of Avengers. He did some Thor. He did, oh, he did, you know, it's funny. He did Thor right before Simonson took over. That's great. Uh, there's his Falcon work. Did a little bit of ROM. Armor Wars, I'm telling you, it's the stuff. After that, oh, you know what he did? He did the backup series in Captain America when Scourge was running around shooting people. Um, during the Bloodstone Hunt, which is a very excellent Captain America story. If you've never read the Bloodstone Hunt, seek it out. It's awesome. Um, I think Kieran Gillen did the art. Um, and uh, it's it's literally hunting for the pieces of the Bloodstone to grant someone immortality. Uh, Baron Zemo. Uh, uh, it's the first appearance of Crossbones. Um, you got like Machete and all these like B-list dudes straight out of Master of Kung Fu have to fight Cap and Diamondback as they run across the, the world trying to put these pieces together. Really great series. But there was like a short uh, three, four page backup that was about Scourge of the Underworld who was going around killing uh, bad guys. And Mark drew that Scourge backup story during those. Um, so then we get him on G.I. Joe. Uh, and from here, from what I can see is G.I. Joe 89 was the first one he did. Uh, 90, 92, 93, 94, 95, 6, 98, 100, of course, 101, 102, 103, 4, 5, 6, and 8. So left right before uh, uh, 9. And remember, 8 is that great cover with uh, Snake Eyes holding uh, Cobra Commander hostage, you know, in uh, in front of all the um, Cobra troopers that are, that are pointing their putting their guns at him. I uh, came back for 131. Did a little bit of Black Panther work. That's with Chris Priest. Uh, he did the, unfortunately, he did. It's not his fault, but he did the Marvel, uh, M-A-R-V-I-L-L-E miniseries. If you guys know that story, that's a bad story for a bad story podcast. Uh, the the editor-in-chief at the time, Bill Jemis from Marvel, they were they were launching the ultimate universe and like it was a weird thing like he boasted that he could make any book sell. there was something my memory's fogging out there was something basically he said he could do any book and it would you know they could do it so he took over writing chores and let's just say he's not a writer it was terrible an absolutely terrible book but mark bright drew it um so it looks really good let's leave it at that and of course his work on Quantum and Woody uh, can't be understated. Quantum and Woody's fabulous. If you've never read it, I don't know how to read it today. Uh, I, it's I. Well, I know they. I know Valiant collected it in trade in the in the mid two thousand tens. I don't know if that's still available these days. I'm actually not sure the current status of that whole Valiant universe. Um, but there's probably trades. It's. I was gonna say it's easy to get a collection together, but it's actually not super. easy easy the last time I tried to put one together because I think print runs weren't super huge on it and quantum and woody and then the people who like it really like it they want to hold on to it um so when I put my collection together in the early 2000s it was hard for me to get one of everything they weren't expensive by any stretch of the imagination but I had to do a lot of hunting uh and the hardest one of all was the there was a a singular one shot called goat and it was about <laughs> it was about a super spy goat that hung out with him, and it's stupid and it's funny, um, but it was impossible to find, like really hard to find for years. Um, so, uh, goat might be the last book that you get, uh, which is ironic because we are absolutely talking about a goat. Um, so, with that, uh, I've rambled on enough. One of my, uh, if you if it hasn't come through, an absolute uh, artistic uh, hero of mine. Uh, it was very sad to hear that he passed this week. Um, I hope all of you uh, enjoy his work. I hope you uh, enjoyed going down this little memory lane with me, talking about how great Mark Bright was. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, seek it out, man. Really, any of this stuff. Go to like go to those um like, dot fandom pages or fandom dot what is it like fandom dot dc fandom dot marvel dot fandom dot com or dc dot fandom dot com. Those two websites do a really wonderful job with. Uh, giving you like biographies of books that different artists worked on, whether it was 
you know, they just penciled it or inked it or just did the covers and all that stuff. It's, it's not a hundred percent perfect. There's, you, you always find a little bit of tweaking, but it's, it's a communal wiki thing and it's really, really great. So if you're looking for just general comic stuff, you want to find all the books someone worked on, those are really great resources for it. And that's where like I pulled all this stuff. I love seeing that. I really read almost all his, like I probably read 80% of his major comics output, which is awesome. Like that makes me so happy. Um, and it's great. I, I love seeing, hearing that he went on to work in, um, you know, like advertising and storyboards because I hadn't seen a lot of his work and I wasn't sure what happened to him. Um, whether it was his choice, I mean, I hope it was his choice, but, uh, I know those fields pay, pay better. And I hope, I hope he had a really great life and I hope, uh, I know, I'm sure his, I'm, I hope he was surrounded by family who will miss him. I know his fans are going to miss him. Um, and, uh. You know, if you, I never had a chance to meet him, but if you ever did, count yourself lucky because he is an absolute talent. I think he's one of the, um, I put him in that category of Gil Kane where he was a, Gil Kane was, I think, underappreciated, uh, a real workhorse, someone who really could deliver the goods and really distinctive stuff. And I don't think was appreciated in his time. Uh, and I think Mark Bryce kind of like that too. I think uh, his stuff is just solid and fun. He really drew like an action figure come to life. I mean, we talk about that a lot on the show. Sometimes, sometimes your your GI Joe art will look like army, like actual real human soldiers, and sometimes they look like action figures. And I love the action figure look because they are action figures. And really, Mark Mark did a great job with that. He did a great job balancing the action figure with the real. So, uh, rest in peace, Mark Bright. And um, everyone, you know, appreciate who you appreciate and celebrate them while they're here because you never know. Um, so we, we lost a star for G.I. Joe, and I hope this, uh, I hope everyone takes this for the celebratory half hour that it's been because I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you for coming along on this journey with me. And uh, now you know a lot more about Mark Bright than you probably did a half hour ago. And knowing more about Mark Bright is half the battle. Uh,